we're going to do questions. Please think about your questions. And I'm going to invite you that as, as you think about your questions, please think of questions. Um, many people will want to ask questions. And if you use time um, sharing a story or elaborating on the context for your question, you'll reduce the number of questions we can get to. So please think in advance about what your question is and ask your question when it comes your turn to, to go up to the mics. Um, before we take the questions, though, I, I want to start by um, doing two things. Number one, thank you. You guys are extraordinary. And I think everybody here agrees with that. I want to set some context for their questions. Can you still hear me? There we go. Maybe. Um, I want to set some context for their questions. And I want to start with some personal things. I hope you'll forgive me for putting you on the spot. But it's all in good fun, right? Um, and that is, I'd first like to start out by inviting you to characterize to us what, how you characterize your theology or relationship with God. Atheist, agnostic, theist, something altogether other than those, how do you personally characterize your relationship with God and theology? Can anyone hear me? Okay, it's working. All right. It, uh, that's complicated. But, uh, but I, I don't know, broadly theist, but non-standard, very naturalistic God, I suppose, but also the God of the philosophers, the God more or less of the Christian tradition. Thank you. Uh, probably also complicated, especially in given context. A bit of history, of course, I was raised in Soviet Union, uh, as most of us, we were raised atheists. Um, was always interested in philosophy and religion, just as I was interested in science, without any necessarily personal relationship, just interested. Uh, right now, the progression was towards more agnostic, so like, I don't say that something does not exist or does exist if I don't have enough evidence. And then next stage was maybe just a question of terminology, what people call God, other call nature, unknown laws of universe, and many other names. So maybe we're just arguing about terminology. A little bit of completely personal stuff. Sometimes I had very interesting situations where I talk to someone and it works. And uh, I intend to keep talking. I, again, stay agnostic about terminology and so on and so forth and remain scientist. But nevertheless, I mean, there are things that are not explained by science and scientists should admit that such things exist. So, complicated relationship, but still kind of positive. Thank you, Irina. Nancy. I am perhaps best described as an Orthodox member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I come from a very traditional heritage, and I feel very comfortable there. Now, in saying that, I've uh, very cleverly avoided the question of my own relationship with God. Um, I'm working on it just like everybody else. I uh, tend to focus a lot on doing the right things and less on building the right relationships, I think. Uh, so I'm still growing there. Thank you, Nancy. Lovely, and what a generous question. I, like Nancy, um, have a tradition that I can black box and thus defer the question entirely on mostly. I'm <laughs> quite happily um, orthodox in most cases. Although I think in fact, what I would say, just to complicate it a bit, is you know, words are actions and actions are a type of word. And I find most claims when it comes to my orthodoxy, the doctrine, whether atheist, agnostic, or theist, or something else, unsatisfying. I, I share some of Irina's terminological uh, lack of satisfaction in all of us. So I think of myself as orthopraxic, and I think that actions are the types of words or claims or doctrine that I believe in. Um, and in that sense, like, absolutely, whatever God means as a word, set that aside. And as an action, it feels quite satisfying, right? There's moments of awe in my life, whether art or nature or literature or time or silence, that has a meaning that transcends what words means, and that is itself a kind of action performance. Um, I don't know what that means, but it feels close enough to orthodox you know, within our cool tradition that I can say that without uh, obvious contradiction, I think. I don't know. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, figuring it out. 
So second question for you, and we're getting closer to questions, so be thinking about your questions. Um, and this builds from the first, and some of you mentioned this already a little bit, if you want to elaborate, great. What is your religious heritage? Now we're talking more cultural now than personal. Um, what's your religious heritage and where are you at religiously today? Well, uh, I grew up Unitarian, which doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and uh, currently I go to an Anglican church, which is also in my heritage and uh, also uh, notorious for not meaning very much, though it does mean more than Unitarianism. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what else there is to say. Uh, you know, somewhat heterodox approach to both of those traditions. Thank you, Wolf. Okay, yeah, as I mentioned, like personally, yeah, I grew up, grew up in Soviet Union in the family of scientists, uh, but open-minded scientists. Well, my, Actually, grand grandfather, I mean, the on father's side, Jewish, he was a rabbi. Uh, but on mother's side, I mean, yeah, uh, just I think uh, usual Christian, uh, yeah, roots. Uh, mother and father were not particularly religious, again, Soviet Union, atheism, but neither were they particularly against it. So, just okay. Very matter of fact, okay, so evidence, we can observe it, the rest, don't know. So as I said, as I uh, was kind of going along my journey, I got very interested in, I wouldn't even call it religion, and I don't consider myself Buddhist. I'm just very curious about all the knowledge and practice accumulated in Buddhism regarding uh, human mind. Uh, I consider it's very interesting empirical science of mind that modern neuroscience, psychology, and AI has a lot to learn from. And as I mentioned, I think yesterday, I wish one day I'll write a book about Buddhism for machine learners. <laughs> I probably should start doing that because there are many interesting lessons that uh, have some statistical interpretations. So for example, I would interpret one of the kind of common ideas from Buddhism not to impose too many, too structured priors and keep your priors as flat as possible and observe the data. Makes sense. So, I don't know, I rather would say that approach to Buddhism as philosophy and um, empirical science of mind. Thank you, Irina. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think how to to frame or answer this question without just giving the same answer as last time. I'm descended from Utah pioneers. Uh, we have you know, a cedar chest in my parents' house with artifacts from the journey across the plains that we sometimes pull out and discuss. Um, I am also the daughter of a convert to the church. And I grew up in California where uh, church culture is a little different than in Utah. So there are some uh, variations there. I found it a very warm and comfortable way to grow up, possibly because I was a girl who loved tech during the affirmative action era in California. Everybody patted me on the back just for doing what I liked doing anyway. It was really great. Um, yeah, where I am today is moving to Christ, the best way I know how. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, again, generous questions, hard ones. Um, Right, so uh, what can I say? I can say that I'm descendant from a long line of like LDS pioneers uh, who tend to produce the joke is like people who work the hardest they can to find how to make their lives even harder, right? Like, um, and as a consequence, kind of produce general authorities or heretics or occasionally both, and those are my very favorite. Um, and that's a silly way to put it, but I, I also really value the fact that I'm um, a child of a convert and in some ways inherit this wonderful like North Dakotan farmin, farmer, not quite pagan, but naturalistic uh, like uh, worldview, maybe with a little um, you know, church on Sunday afternoon. Um, and that 
that works uh, quite well. I, I think that's a, a comfortable space. I grew up in Iowa, Iowa City. Um, I'm used to being uh, a minority Mormon, and that works quite well for me. It allows me a kind of license and freedom to think and argue and disagree and be who I think I am. And there, um, I mean, I actually living in Oklahoma the last 13 years has been interesting because I'm surrounded by people who are often more overtly and practicing more Christian than I am in the Bible Belt. Um, Right, and that's both humbling and awe-inspiring and also really hard because there's a fair amount of anti-Mormonism there. Um, I've lived in you know, Iowa and then both coasts and in most of those places, Mormonism is just like whatever. You know, you're know, you a Zoroastrian and a Jewish person and a Mormon walk into a bar and it's all fine. But in Oklahoma, it's a, it's a thing because uh, I think the evangelical culture is a little bit too close. Um, what was the last question? How, where am I religiously? A Sunday school president and... Uh, Yep, it was a praxic. It's, uh, it's, it's hard, it's good, it forces me to be part of a community, uh, it makes me realize there's more things at work than I see. It, uh, it does good socioeconomic work sometimes. It, um, uh, it's, it's good for question asking for me. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Let's stretch you guys in the other direction now. Um, those first questions may have been maybe a little bit more stretching for um, some of us who aren't Mormon. These next questions might be a little bit tougher for people who don't um, as strongly identify with, say, transhumanism. Um, and here's the first of the two questions. Do you think, and some of you talked about this in your talks a little bit, so maybe it'll be just putting it into a nutshell to get context for the questions that are coming. Do you think, in a nutshell, that we are going to develop AGI and why? in a nutshell, not, not the long version, the short version. Are we going to develop AGI, and why or why not? That's complicated, but more, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's possible. We might be close. The engineers are working around the clock on it. They might succeed. Nothing is guaranteed. Thanks, Wolf. Okay, I uh, remember the second slide in my deck after the intro slide. It was definition of AGI, the elephant and the blind man defining it. So um, I hate to, answer, uh, to ask a question, <laughs> response to question, because it depends on your definition. Yep. Just like with God, <laughs> all depends on definition. Your definition. Uh, my definition. So uh, as I was saying again in my presentation, so I wanted to stick to more kind of um, based definition. So, well, it's called artificial general intelligence. General has certain meaning. Let's stick to that meaning. By general, indeed, like, well, open AI kind of definition. So, highly multitask generalizing system, uh, orders of magnitude better than what we had just a few years ago. Seems like we are on the way there, although particular way we're doing it right now may or may not be the way. I'm pretty confident that getting to AGI will happen. I don't know whether it's going to be like an asymptote or it's going to be phase transition. Actually, I don't know. It could be the second one if the compositionality hypothesis holds. Like once you accumulate enough of building blocks, then everything else can be well approximated by recombination then it's phase transition, then the singularity. So singularity may follow from the standard collection of PCA components of the world. So I, I'm pretty confident it will happen. Uh, I don't know about, like whenever people ask about timelines, I mean, there is this whole bunch of people guessing timelines, changing timelines, posting on Twitter that Ajaya Kotra just uh, pushed her AGI timeline earlier, or Paul Cristiano moved it there, and like, I don't know, I mean, it's very subjective probability territory. So the answer is, with high probability, yes. The question, what exactly it gonna mean? Is it gonna be what people think uh, traditionally, like one super intelligent agent, or just gonna be a population? Like, as I kept saying, did you ever see intelligence develop in isolation? There was also always population of animals, population of people, population of intelligent um, entities at certain level. It's probably gonna be some population. 
uh, an intelligence of the elements and population will be increasing, and most likely, I think it will be, yeah, it will be some symbiotic kind of group of agents and people in increasing their intelligence kind of interchangeably. So I think that that will be probably most interesting, quite realistic, and maybe practical way to building AGI. So you basically include them in the society, you teach them, they will teach you, they will teach each other, we will teach each other. So it's all complex dynamical system of intelligent agents with different substrate of intelligence, but who cares? Thank you, Irina. Nancy. I have seen nothing that precludes the possibility. I have been dreaming about it ever since I was 10. Uh, in fact, my first award-winning short story involved computers that had bootstrapped their way to self-will and intelligence and then What's destroyed. What's the name so people can look oh, it Oh, it's called uh, The Breath of Heaven. Um, it, it was a high school writing contest, so just look at the other ones. Um, <laughs> The computers did indeed kill all the colonists and start their own society. Um, yeah, I don't know where that takes us. <laughs> I'm honestly kind of annoyed that we're so close to AGI apparently right now because now I can no longer dream about it in peace. I have to think about real world consequences and I can't just imagine all the magical wonderful things without conceiving that I might bear responsibility for some of the other things. Uh, but it's an exciting time to be here. Uh, it will be an adventure. Thank you, Nancy. Ben. Lovely, Nancy. I look forward to reading that. That sounds cool. High school writing for the win. Um, yeah, so I suppose I would say in some, if we mean it in like a AGI in the most cosmological sense, no. Um, by which I mean we did not develop, we will not develop it because AGI already exists. It's called nature and the world and the universe and there is no need for a simulation because we're already in thick relationships with one another. That's the kind of like base cosmology position. We didn't do it, but it's already intelligent in general. But I think if we wanted to do a more like a definitions um, game, I think the way I would think about it is, you know, let's do artificial general and intelligence. So I think, does intelligence exist? Sure. Yes. yes. Um, what about artificial? I want to say with Walter Ong, a really interesting Jesuit priest and media theorist, that uh, there's nothing more human than artifice, which I think is a quite lovely line, or artificial, and that in particular, while this is not unique to humans, intelligence has always been artificial. Like, um, what you and I are doing are learning, remember how hard long division was? in fourth or third or second grade if you're in the Soviet Union, right? Like, um, like, like it's, it was rough. That's artifice, that's convention, that is hard discipline. Um, so is grammar, so is learning a language, so is the hard, humbling work of being in relationships with one another. So in, in that sense, intelligence has always been artificial. Now, what I trip up about actually is the question of general. Um, in my view, artificial intelligence is almost always particular. And the highest forms of intelligence are particular. They don't reconcile, they don't generalize. I think this is lovely and good. Here's my pluralistic worldview, the cosmology that welcomes lots of things at work. So for example, like, we were thinking about, um, you know, how do we, or there's an earlier question about how do we reclaim and empower minorities, right? So Sylvia Winter, really interesting, uh, black feminist critic um, uh, is totally fascinating, not just because she is herself a black woman, right? But she is, I mean, she also is that, and that like provides a certain performative power to her critique. But what's really interesting about her intelligence is, insert some particularity here, she knows a lot about um, Spaniard history. And so when she talks about like the, the intersections of what it is to be black and queer and a woman in the modern world, she's able to port it through the slave trade and the transatlantic experience and the you know, Transamerica um, experience. Right? She has particularity that gives her critique, her view, her perspective, her intelligence uh, general value. And so I think I want to imagine a world which happens to look a lot like this one, but could look otherwise, it could look even better, um, in which intelligence is artificial and it's our own and it's very particular. And one of the best ways that we can um, adopt and generalize particularities is to welcome and earn our own and to share them and help them with others. So that like level of not trying to generalize, I think, is necessary to think about these types of questions. Here's an here's a example. Um, NLP, natural language processing, has the same problem. It, we're not talking about language generally. We're talking about English. 
there's 10,000 languages, uh, you know, and maybe a few thousand of them are alive in the world, but the numbers of languages that we can run NLP on are, you know, three, four, there's you know, English, Mandarin, I digress. Chinese. I digress, I disagree. Well, you show me a power curve and I'll agree that in practice English is dominant and that there's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be Mandarin, there's gonna be Russian, there's gonna be Spanish, there's other ways that we can uh, arrive at this, but if you want trillions of, you know, like well-populated, rich, uh, growing uh, data sets. You need to lean into where you have, and that's okay. It just means that we begin with a world that's differentiated. It's not, it's not a general language, it's existing languages. It's not uh, Aztec, right? Or like, you know, uh, a forgotten language that we invented in middle school. Adamic. Yeah, or Adamic, yeah. But the particulars are useful here. But please, but Facebook, disagree. Facebook's getting close to Adamic, come on. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, I, well, I think I may be, <laughs> I think I may be disagreeing with a different point than the one you were making. I do agree that treatment of language in AI models is very stratified, yeah. all the way down to the level of tokenization. It takes like twice as many tokens to represent a sentence for ChatGPT in Arabic as it does in English, meaning that functionally the context window available for Arabic speakers is smaller than the context window of information available to the AI model for English speakers if you're using like a standard monolingual model. There are language specific models. There are machine translation systems. I believe they have 200 to 200 languages. They are pretty bad at the low resource languages. They are pretty good at the high resource languages. But uh, even the low resource languages, uh, I find it pretty impressive. I'm not, I'm not unimpressed. I'm just <laughs> saying that it's not general. It's stratified. Yeah. It what is stratified. What about Cahir's recent model, highly multilingual? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not general. Uh, yeah. As the tokenization come on, the byte level transformers are coming. Tokenization will be out of window. Another bitter lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tokenization, too much linguistic structure imposed. I mean, just like again, uh, what's being thrown away one by one is all the stuff that requires too much human involvement and effort. So it's automation is going to, it's, it's, it's a progression of the automation. The history of humankind is a progression of automation and it doesn't show any signs of stopping. So your, your tokenizers will be replaced by byte level models. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Let's take our first question. Step up, speak close. <clears throat> okay, it's the same question I always ask. What do you think a redness quad? Am I being better? Keep going. Keep going. Talk. Oh, sorry. Just talk. Just talk. Oh, oh. What do you think a redness quality is, and a subjective redness quality is, and do you think once we objectively discover and demonstrate that, will they play, will that play a key part in the way understanding the way humans compute, think, and feel? Can I get a definition of redness quality? When you look at that patch when I put on my screen a redness quality, you experience redness. Oh, I am so sorry. I was out running a family drive during oh, your sorry. presentation. <laughs> I will sit out on this one. Okay. <laughs> I just kind of, re your question reminded me a recent tweet. Uh, I actually didn't watch the whole thing. When uh, <laughs> Jeff Hinton said, there is no such thing as qualia. I still want to watch the thing, like what exactly, what the hell he meant. That there is no quality. No, I'm just curious. So that's uh, because, yeah, your perception of redness, which is, by the way, different for different people, especially, say, yeah, if you're Daltonic and you do not differentiate between red and green, then perception is different, right? So what is redness? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've thought about this one for like 10 years. Um, <laughs> but before the era of deep learning, when we didn't have the neural metaphor quite as is salient. Uh, I use the metaphor of the hash table. If you hash a bunch of sense data into categories, you get these irreducible symbols that are then compared within the hash table or whatever al algorithm you're using. And the way I like to think about qualia is in our perceptions of things, our perceptual system digests what we're seeing into irreducible symbols that can be compared with each other they maybe have distance to each other, but they don't have structure inside of them. And this, this is what people mean by qualia, is like a, a sense perception that does not have internal structure. It only has comparison. And 
now in the era of deep learning, we have better metaphors that are perhaps closer to what our brain's actually doing. If we look inside of a deep learning model, you see a neuron firing or activating. Uh, it corresponds to some internal symbol that is irreducible except in its relations to all the other symbols. And I think that's what qualia is. Qualia is just what that feels like from the inside when you are that model or you are that intelligent being sort of feeling those sensory digests, feeling the irreducibility of, of these symbols. That's what that feels like. It feels like, you know, this, this irreducible redness. Well, that's just the irreducible, that symbolness uh, within whatever information processing systems your mind is using. As for the second part of your question, as we understand this, is it going to be crucial? I think maybe it's going to be the other way around. As we uh, build more and more advanced systems that pick up more and more of the behaviors that we regard as being, uh, you know, unique to us or, or constituting our intelligence, we will come to see uh, an external model that we can understand that accounts for what we feel internally. And so all of our feelings and qualia and so on will become things that we can understand by, by mechanical example um, rather than only having the subjective experience of them. So. Uh, just briefly, uh, first philosophy course I ever took at BYU asked the question, what is redness? And it became very clear to me that there are like tens of thousands of pages written in analytic philosophy that do not answer the question. And let me just offer that maybe like the move from there to feelings and senses is just the wrong order. Like what if instead we said, as I think actually people who know more than I do have just said, that the meaning of redness is encountered in this scrum of its experience, so in the hash or in the coding of it, in the, um, in the definition of the programming is where you're going to encounter it in this moment, but a different red, the red of a sunset or the red of the sunset on here or the red of the lipstick kiss on a love letter with tears on it or the red of um, blood or, you know, the, the red that urges into orange, all of these reds have meaning not because they belong to redness, some platonic generalization, but because they were encountered in the, in the scrum of experience. And that, that's where you can begin, and that's where we end, too, right? Like, the particularity of AI is, is its intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, we're still doing great on time. So, if, if, by the way, if you have a question that you're going to want to ask, I recommend you get in line, because at some point I'm going to ask people not to get in line anymore, just so you know. Um, go ahead, Randy. Imagine that you're the CEO of a company, a horrible corporation, that has developed the most influential AI in the world, and you have a trillion dollars, and you are asking yourself, how do I bias my programming for a particular alignment versus another one? And I come in as your chief ethical officer and say, You've asked the wrong question. You need to ask how you can bias it toward contestation of alignment with no final answer. Would you tell me, that's a cop-out. I've got to come to an alignment decision. Which way would you go? How would you think about it? If I was an evil CEO, I would optimize the model for the bottom line exclusively and only. That would be the alignment. If I was an ethical CEO, now the question gets really dicey. I don't quite see a very clear dichotomy between evil and ethical CEO. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, <laughs> Plus, uh, often, like, once you become CEO, by definition, some will see you as evil. So, <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> uh, but, okay, so I think it's back to, the question uh, goes back to your talk. Right? So basically, uh, I, I, I might not completely understand it correctly, but say that one particular type of alignment uh, versus allowing for, well, democracy of potentially conflicting opinions, but somehow reaching some, whatever, agreement, not, not complete agreement, but reaching some balance, some peace, like in your slide. So essentially, allowing for multiple opinions and multiple definitions of uh, alignment and somehow uh, letting those things coexist rather than picking a particular one and um, just sticking to that, right? Mm. So, so what would you do? I mean, again, 
Uh, I think, uh, first of all, the smart CEO should really ask researchers. Uh, but whenever you were telling the story, I was wondering if you really think about Sam Altman and Elias Otskever having this conversation, <laughs> literally, last November. Uh, now, I mean, I think smart CEO, whether evil or not, will probably understand that if he goes for one particular alignment, it will not end well for others and eventually for the company. So, probably would go for the multi had it alignment <laughs> system, yeah. which somehow need to maintain this equilibrium. How, that's a good question. Yeah, in terms of the how, if you stick with existing technologies like constitutional language models, yeah. then it would involve some democratization process on the chosen alignment objectives specifically. What will this model have as its priorities? What will the training data look like that is used to fine tune it towards a specific alignment? And so you could imagine something akin to our democratic process, but related to how are we as a society going to attempt to align these models? What are their priorities going to be? If you want to think visionary past existing technologies, I'm trying to decide if I should get visionary, but I guess I already started. Do I it. Think, I dream of two things. And, and by dream, I mean sometimes also have nightmares, but I'm fascinated by the possibility <laughs> of two technologies. One is the ability to do what humans do, which is to sometimes have a transcendent moment where your whole world shifts from one essentially training example, right? I listened to a talk once and my whole world is different. An existing language model does not have that capacity. You can give it the talk 500,000 times, and then its world will be different. But it won't happen from one experience, because we don't have the capacity in the parameters of the model to have any event reach in and change the numbers that make up that model's computational structure. So I dream of figuring out how to do such things, giving models such a capacity. I also dream of having a way to simulate the effect of mirror neurons in humans. A mirror neuron reacts the same what, regardless of whether you're watching someone else do something or whether you are experiencing it and performing that action yourself. And I, I, perhaps in my ignorance, I associate that possibility with things like empathy, with things like the ability to do perspective taking, with the ability to have theory of mind. And I feel like if you combine those two things, then there is a possibility through natural interaction of all of the humans on the planet with the language model to, to affect this type of contested alignment. Um, I think I have a solution to your compassion problem, roughly. A <laughs> um, little bit of, yeah, and I should definitely let you look. So, okay, so there was a talk earlier this, uh, during lunch, and I mentioned work by Michael Levine. Uh, long story, I mean, he, he, he's a brilliant uh, biologist uh, who was previously a computer scientist, and the gist of it, like, uh, basically studying the um, intelligence, adaptation, memory in morphology of, um, well, simple organisms like flatworms, and essentially reprogramming them to achieve new attractors in the <laughs> kind of the space of the uh, kind of solutions to this uh, complex dynamical system, uh, like two-headed worms, that are viable and keep like reproducing and so on by merely uh, tweaking the uh, like ion channels and changing the connectivity patterns uh, between the cells so you can basically reprogram organism to take different shapes and like all kind of crazy stuff but where it also relates to your compassion question so here here was the thing so basically we had a long discussion with michael back 2019 after his new ribs talk and uh, he was also mentioning his uh, approach to cancer and so on. So the idea was like communication across cells, bioelectric communication, that's where the magic happens. It doesn't have to be neural network, it's just like bioelectric kind of biological network, lower layer. So if communication changes, then everything changes, the shape of the organism and the properties. So nothing genetic changes, just all epigenetic. So one example was cancer. So one theory is that when the cell stops properly communicating with its neighbors 
and uh, essentially it starts acting as a unicellular organism for which historically if it's unicellular, everything else environment, you eat the environment, right? So uh, the theory was every self, from cell to a group of cells forming organ, to the organism formed from these organs and to group of those organisms as a population and so on and so forth. At every level of the self, uh, the same kind of objective functions to survive and thrive. The question is what's the scale to which objective function is applied? Uh, Space-wise, is it like single one or is cell now part of the organ and takes it into account by communication? If communication is cut, it reverts back to smaller scale and time-wise, like if the cancerous cell uh, reduces the time scale of its objective, then eventually it kills the organism but it will die because of that. It's just like if the time scale reduced, it doesn't understand that. So the idea was, and then I kind of continued on that, that okay, so you probably may want to have a weighted combination of the objective function at different spatial and temporal scales from the individual to whatever size of the group you want. If you take it to infinity, you got your Buddhist universal compassion. So we agreed with Mike that okay, we have theory of Buddhism. But yeah, that, that's a technical way of solving your compassion problem. Yeah, that could, that could, I don't know, I'm stuck on the technical details of how do you get reward signal back from all the people on the planet. But other than that. <laughs> uh, you sample. But once, once you've got it, once you've got it, you can optimize, yeah. Yeah, but basically you just keep, instead of your uh, reward function, objective function, you have similar at different scales. Uh, then the question is how to ascend the weight because you cannot assign zero weight to yourself because, well, you just cease to be trying to protect the organism. You cannot assign vice versa, then you become cancerous. Uh, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? Yep. The weight assignment, the, the regularization weight assignment problem. <laughs> Wolf? Yeah, um, as you may be able to tell from my talk, I've thought about this question uh, as well. Um, I'll play the part of the evil CEO. Uh, you can't uh, hear me, okay. Uh, okay. I was gonna say, uh, I will play the part of the evil CEO here, and, or the advisor to the evil CEO. So here's what you do if you have a billion, or a trillion dollars and a super powerful AI. So the first thing to notice is that money actually isn't all that valuable at that scale if you can't buy the things that you want. So the question is what community are you a part of and does it have the internal economy to produce the things you actually wanna buy? And when you get sufficiently large amount of power, money becomes something within your domain of power that no longer can be uh, what your bottom line actually is. You're now interested in other things. You need to start doing philosophy about what you actually value, what you actually want to buy with that power. And the next thing you need to notice is what Irina was talking about, which is what's the scale of the self? What's the scale of the community? that you find yourself embedded in? Is it just the company? Or is the company not sufficiently large to be sovereign and interesting? So you have this problem of the internal plurality. Uh, what, is, what is the scale at which you establish your internal plurality? Do you need to grow the company to become more sovereign in the area, like building it out in different areas, building out your philosophical wing, your political wing, your demographic wing, your military wing? You know, there's a bunch of things like this. Or you can maybe join up with things that already exist maybe influence them, but you need an internal community. Um, generally, your target is you want to become a polis in the sort of ancient Greek sense, a sovereign city-state, or a sovereign, I mean, city-state is sort of an obsolete form, but, but uh, what it is in the future, we don't know yet. That's another strategic question to get your philosophers on. You need a community of philosophers within your uh, evil company to uh, figure out what, what kind of strategic stance is, is a good idea. But then you have the problem of the external plurality, which is, I think, part of what you were alluding to with uh, values needing to exist in tension with each other. You can't do a universal form of life. I don't think it actually works. I think it just dissolves into internal incoherence. So you need to strategically choose what is the boundary between the internal plurality with which you are friends and the external plurality with which you are rivals. And, um, so you have to figure out who your in-group is. Um, it's probably larger than just your company, uh, unless your company is very 
weirdly sovereign compared to all companies that currently exist or are prospectively going to exist. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say is basically become the philosopher king of a actual polis that tries to differentiate itself from the rest of the world, chasing some novel conception of value that it comes to of its own internal discourse. And don't get hung up on things like the bottom line measured in dollars, because that stuff's no longer relevant. This is starting to sound utopic. <laughs> That's why it's evil. Yeah, I happen to think that uh, sufficiently advanced evil is indistinguishable from the good. <laughs> ben, do you Completely do you agree. Nope. I'll defer. Randall and I will talk later. It's reverse right. hostile takeover. So we're breaking into we're, like we're only going to do these two more questions, monopoly. and we're going, to do, we're going to do our answers to these ones rapid fire. Um, because we only have a few minutes and I want to get to both of them. So um, ask your question succinctly and then we'll respond succinctly. All right, um, Jordan. Okay, well I was gonna say something about Unitarians because I am one and I take offense at what you said, <laughs> but I'll let, that, I'll let that be, it's okay. I'm a good Unitarian, I can take it. Um, so my question is, um, what is the probability in your, each of your minds that consciousness can be modeled and in, in addition to that, you know, human consciousness generally, and individual human consciousnesses. Um, and if you think that is possible, like greater than 50% poss you know, probability, how important would that project be to you personally? Interesting question. You should have invited Joshua Benjo to talk about consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, take your best shot. Um, I think consciousness is a sort of a inherent property of life and or intelligence. You can't really get rid of it. It's not separate from those processes. Anything that's living is conscious in some sense. The things that are more conscious are maybe more living or have a more advanced form of life. Uh, so the question isn't necessarily how do you model consciousness, but how do you construct life? And uh, I think you know constructing life is a very interesting problem. I've done, I've got four kids. Uh, that's, my, <laughs> that's my version, but maybe we'll build other things. Uh, Thank you. I, know. I I would uh, again start with the same question, but you're going to hate me about the definition of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> because again, it really just like a few other loaded words we mentioned earlier, it means different things to different people. Use your definition. But again, like from neuroscience perspective, you can define the person or animal kind of being conscious or unconscious when animal or a human is conscious, they do pay attention uh, to environment. So in a sense, attention can be proxy of consciousness or something like that. So, uh, but here is a good question. I mean, if there are several functional properties of consciousness that uh, um, a being who we would call conscious exhibits, if your system does the same thing, so if functionally you're like, okay, if you're a philosophical zombie, do you really care whether you have any qualia or consciousness, or for all practical purposes, you act as if you're consciousness, co conscious. So um, I think I would be okay with philosophical zombies, but probably not everybody would be. <laughs> Thank you. My definition of consciousness is heavily entangled with my definition of spirit. As such, uh, I would have to hold the position that consciousness comes from God. And so any quest in the direction of AGI would not be about modeling consciousness, but creating a physical substrate in which a divine consciousness could rest. Beautiful. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, I, it, at some level, zero, and I have a definition problem, which is like, you don't know that I have conscience or consciousness, or I don't know that you have it. It's not empirically verifiable. It's not that we would be okay with philosophical zombies, it's that we may as well be philosophical zombies, we can't know otherwise. And if that's the case, then we can begin to build up and like say, if that's not a satisfying answer, which I don't think it is, then like we have to be talking about something else. And I think we're talking about practice, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about real application. So, it's not high on my priority list. Thank you. Yep, I'll, thank you. I'll save my question for dinner. Uh, Thanks. In the interest of time. All right, we're going to do one more question from me, and then we're going to wrap up. Here's the last question. Can you hear me all right? 
Seems like I can't hear myself. All right, the, here's the last question. If your teenage self, if you had a, the opportunity to talk with your teenage self right now and tell them, hey, listen, someday you are going to give a presentation at a conference for the Mormon Transhumanist Association, how would that teenage self have reacted? Very excited because that 14 year old, I remember as yesterday, just discovered in a Russian bookstore translation of Can Machines Think? And it was like, cool, I want to do AI. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to dispute the premise of the question. How many people have seen uh, The Kid, the movie The Kid? There's this scene in that movie, it's a fabulous movie, it's one of the best scripted movies I've ever seen. Uh, there's a scene in there where two people are talking and one of them says, you know, if I had a chance to go back and talk to myself, I'd just say everything's gonna be fine. Don't you worry about a thing. Meaning she wouldn't try to give her past self advice or give her past self information, you know, just let let things go the way they did. There's also a Star Trek episode that deals with this same question when Captain Picard has a heart attack. But anyway, I really, I just wouldn't tell her. You wouldn't tell her? I wouldn't tell her. <laughs> I love it. Can I, I'll be brief. I would just, uh, I also zen delight and reflection. And I might say that, you know, don't worry too much about the Mormonism or the transhumanism. Enjoy the association, right? Which I think is the most meaningful community and reality and practice that anyone could hope for. And yeah, that's, that's meaningful. I think my teenage self would say, that's interesting, what's that? Uh, but wouldn't be surprised once explained. Uh, but I would also say to my teenage self, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all so much for being with us. Uh, we feel truly honored. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs>